ideal your expedition would be? Oh, Hans Reinhardt. Hans Reinhardt from Germany. There are as many ideal holidays as there are holiday makers, even if most nowadays seem packaged into the ice cream parlors of the Costa Brava. But young people are turning increasingly to a new idea, the adventure expedition. Tiring, uncomfortable, undoubtedly adventurous. You get out of it what you want to get. The desire has an honorable ancestry, cradled in travelers' tales and littered with roads like the Golden Road to Samarkand that have become legend. Each is a rainbow with some ancient city as its crock of gold. The call of the Muezzin, the plain song of the Muslim minarets, beckons the faithful across the Bosphorus. For our travellers, the summons is to a far more distant land. Istanbul will be but one stopping place on the journey from London to Nepal. This expedition's leader is Mike Demon. He's 28 and for three years has driven the road to Kathmandu and back. His passengers, 25 in all and mostly in their 20s, are as mixed a bunch as you could wish. Right, here we are. On this trip, we've got Susie, who's a professional photographer from New Zealand. There's Tanya, who's a secretary from London. Paul, who's a student from Canada. Ivan, um, a lifeguard from Australia. Valerie, a nurse from England. Peter, who's a Dutchman and he's a carpenter. We've got a couple of Cockney lads, Paul and Jim. Picture postcards of Istanbul mark the true start to the adventure. There's Santa Sophia. Hagia Sophia, the great mosque that was once a church. A reminder that Istanbul was Constantinople and before that Byzantium. Istanbul is the symbolic meeting place of Europe and Asia. It is our travellers' first real chance to test their dreams against the touchstone of reality. From London to Kathmandu by air is 4,500 miles. By road, it is 11,000. The party will cross deserts, three major mountain chains, and a segment of the earth more touched by history than any other. The 12-ton truck will take three jolting and jarring months to do it. Inevitably, one wonders about the sort of man who will choose to lead such expeditions for a living, as Mike Demon has done. I worked for a firm of stockbrokers in the city of London. I was involved very much in doing investment analysis for mining stocks mainly, visiting companies that I would then write investment reports upon. I think subconsciously became jaundiced with the way of life that I was leading. One rainy winter morning, when I woke up and I just couldn't face going into an underground train, and I just decided that, that was it, and I wasn't going to do it anymore. The southern coast of Turkey gives passengers their first feel of adventure. I think for all of our passengers, the lure of adventure is paramount. They could travel by plane. They could even travel in an air-conditioned coach. So there must be something that makes them choose to ride in the back of a truck. Do you know what you expect from such a journey? 
Or is what you seek merely what you find? Is this how you'd imagined Ephesus, famed for its temple of Diana? Do you picture St. Paul preaching to the Ephesians? Or hear the furious voices of the city's craftsmen, angered by Paul's disdain of idols, meeting to protest in the theatre that could hold 25,000 of them? All the way along there, they'd have had their sort of dressing rooms and administrative rooms and so on, and then there's a tunnel which goes through from those ruins you see there right into the floor of the stage, and that's where the actors would have... What would they have done? Just acting? Would they have been lions and things? It was mainly dramatic performances and sort of choral works, I think, oh. and, and so on. They had a very stylized. It's terribly format. high up the top there. People at the back really were miles from the stage. Yeah, but they? you find the acoustics in there are absolutely fantastic. Really? I mean, yeah, if you go and stand in the middle um, and the rest of the group stands around the top up there um, and you just talk in an ordinary speaking voice, yeah, yeah, the whole lot of them will hear you. Yeah. It's amazing. Some may see this stop as the journey's high point. Others may prefer what the next holds. That's the point about such an expedition. You never know. Where you can't stop, the passing images provoke their own imaginings. The Lycian rock tombs admirer Demre must have intrigued the many crusaders who came this way. And they didn't have time to stop either. On such a trip, a scene more suited to the family snapshot album serves a double purpose. There are already 3,000 miles of dust to be erased by the waters of the eastern Mediterranean, but there are 8,000 rugged miles still to go, with not a sea in sight. The first sight of the valleys of Cappadocia is what one might have expected from the surface of the moon. But this lunar landscape is inhabited, with dwellings carved as hideouts in the rock pinnacles by Christians fleeing Muslim persecution. The Christians left their mark before the encroaching Muslim settlements finally drove them out. The trail moves on to eastern Turkey, to the north, Mount Ararat, where Noah's Ark came to rest, to the south, Mesopotamia, and the Garden of Eden. But this is no earthly paradise. The climate runs to extremes, and the fiercest day can be overtaken by a frozen nightfall. The expedition found it at first a hardship to sleep in sub-zero temperatures for two or three nights, but they got used to it. Gradually, you who travel become toughened. Remember, 700 years ago, Marco Polo came this way on his journey to the Great Khan, and he took three years about it. But the Kurds... The Kurds have been here since a thousand years before that. They have survived in areas far more remote and far more wintry. To the Kurds, the traveller is a bearer of curiosities, of cameras and plastic clothing, but he is only of literally a passing interest. What does the Kurd, tough and dignified, need with our modern baubles, when his food, his tools and his techniques have served him well enough these past two thousand years? Come on, you lot. Big, big hands on the 
This type of trip is basically a camping trip, and it is rough camping. There are certain things one learns never to do when camping in the wild, and that is, for instance, not to camp in, say, a wadi. Even though it looks as if it hasn't rained for two centuries, a flash flood can take the whole lot away. <laughs> It's very important that the passengers should feel that they are responsible for the destiny of that trip and also for its day-to-day -day running. Groups of three, usually, will do the cooking on a specific day. They will also do the shopping in the local bazaars. Seven rupees, one kilo. Seven rupees? Yes, one kilo. Seven rupees a kilo? I think they're okay, actually. Yeah, yeah you pick they look a bit green. We got eight in there. That, that was the first one and a half kilo. Yeah. About two, two, it's hard telling whether they're ripe or not, but I think they're all soft inside. Yeah. You know, they're, they're good inside. They're just. Uh, this 24 we got in there, right? That's all they do. I'm a bit suspicious of this scale method he uses, you know? Yeah. I think it depends on how he sort of holds it up in his hand. That'd be the look then. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Good to go in. Yeah, it should be enough. I'm getting an average of about 12 slices. See, the tomatoes have gone back to their normal shape after being more like plums before. The quality of the food on these trips can vary enormously. I've had cordon bleu cooks on trips who've produced the most revolting meals. On the other hand, I've had people who've never cooked in their lives consistently producing very palatable meals. Spend my money. They'd set out from London with a ton and a half of food to be supplemented by local buying. Mike Demon usually tries to find someone who knows about accountancy to sort out the details. So the, the, the total amount spent in that country was 11,396. 11, Mike doesn't like to think of himself as in the normal run of tourist guides. There's certainly little similarity between this and a coach trip to Ostend. But before they cross each frontier, he does tell his expeditionaries a little about the country and the culture they are about to meet. In this case, Iran. Our first stop in Iran will be Isfahan, where we'll spend two, two and a half days. There's a hell of a lot to see there, and you'll have to ration yourselves. Isfahan, the magic city of the magic carpet, the mosaic of its life as colourful as that on the domes of its many mosques. The idea of the bazaar may have been romantic. The reality is simply what it is, the Persian marketplace. The intricate artistry of the handicrafts make them ideal trinkets for the tourist. But to the Persian, even the interminably beaten brassware will be merely a household utensil.
American face down. <laughs> These are all original paintings. These are by imagination. And uh, we, we use the very nice matter from our literature, from Omar Khayyam. Omar Khayyam was a famous popular poet. And he has very nice stories about peaceful life. You know, these are all by imagination. We have no model. We read the literature, the story of Omar Khayyam, and we make the figures like this, the sketch, and then color. And the faces that we paint in our painting is not flat. It's just by detail, yeah. the shadow, the color in the face. Magnificent faces, just one by one, the color in the face. And the brush that we use is cutter brush. It's very, very fine brush, just one hair on the top of my brush. So when I finish one painting, it takes one month, or some of them is more than one month, it's one year. For instance, that Seven, seven Adventure of Rostam, that takes one year to paint. Where the artist needs inspiration, he need not stray far from his own front door. From the minarets and mosques of Isfahan, it is 400 miles south to the magnificence of Persepolis. These representations of the various tributaries that brought annual tribute to the Persian emperor, each figure represents a sort of different nationality. There would have been Babylonians and Scythians, Armenians, um, and so on. And you can see they're all carrying something. At least those ones there are. I think the ones there with the lances are members of the guard escorting them in to see the emperor. This is in fact one of his uh, spring palaces, was it? Yeah, Darius stayed here um, in the spring, and then he, in the winter he'd travel up to his other palace at Akbatana, which is um, modern Hamdan. And it's fantastic when you think of the distances that they covered every year just to visit their palaces. for something like 1,600 miles at one mile an hour. These ruins are known as the Throne of Jamshid. If you want their epitaph, look to Irma Khayyam. They say the lion and the lizard keep the courts where Jamshid gloried and drank deep. If Omar came this way, it was a hard coming, for he lived and died at Nishapur, and between here and there lies one of the world's great barriers. Then the only way of crossing the great Iranian desert was by camel. It took up to three weeks. Today, the expedition's truck will do it in four days. All right, we'll have a look at the oil baths. Yeah. We'll probably change the oil now. Um, when we go into the desert, we'll have to check the oil regularly every day mm -hmm. uh, and possibly... When I started in this game, my mechanical ability was virtually nil on the road. I now reckon that I could handle any problem on a diesel engine truck. Yeah, you have to check also every day when we're on dirt roads, various mountings. The vehicles that we use for these expeditions are built by ourselves. Um, we purchase a basic chassis and we put onto it a military body with our own designed cover with clear windows in and the sides of this can roll up in a number of combinations so that people can be exposed to the country they're travelling through. The intense heat turns the earth to dust and the dust to powder. The traveller might well wonder how anything or anyone could exist in such a place. But man has furnished the desert with his own surprises. The answer to the heat was water, cool water. 
Sure, they had their camels, and every schoolboy knows that camels carry water in their humps, but even a camel has to refill. The water was collected in these old brick-lined cisterns and cooled by the draft of air rushing across the surface and up the tall funnel. Simple technology is often the best. Today, although it is dried up through lack of use, its very coolness is a blessing. It is a short respite, a comma in the long sentence of the desert. But there are other pauses. The nights spent at the ancient caravanserais. The caravanserais were spaced out across the desert at the distance a camel train could do in a day. Omar Khayyam knew of them too. Think in this battered caravanserai whose doorways are alternate to night and day, how sultan after sultan with his pomp abode his hour or two and went his way. The way was and is back to the desert, punctuated again by tiny villages whose dark corners nourish pockets of cool air which the traveller's lungs drink greedily. It is the fourth and last day of the desert. Ahead lies another border, another confrontation with another culture, another country. Herat marks our entrance into Afghanistan. There's a gun fired every day at noon. But I've always wondered how it is that the gunner sets his watch. Does he do it by the gun, or does he fire the gun according to his watch? The realities of traveling in distant parts, uh, I think undoubtedly have to be different from one's imaginings. To me, an Afghan was some figure from a woodblock print in a book about India. The reality of an Afghan was so beyond that, their strength of character which comes through in their most simple action. For the normal traveller, there is only one route through Afghanistan, the southern road, which is asphalted. There are two other possibilities, the central route, which goes high into the Hindu Kush, and the northern route, this was the one they decided to try. If you front wheel straight, you'll create resistance against the sand and she won't go. All right, so you've got to run them back absolutely straight. The minute you tilt your front wheels, it just won't take. Got it? It has been said that to travel hopefully is a better thing than to arrive, and the true success is to labour. For Mike Demon, the northern route proved more of a challenge than any road he'd tried before. There are invariably hazards on this trip physical hazards. These really involve the vehicle and the roads that we're traveling on. A large proportion of the trip is on dirt roads. A fair proportion of it is on tracks which would turn a hardened truckie's hair gray through mountain passes, rutted hairpin bends. 
one's driving ability is very taxed on this. You have to know exactly to the inch where all four wheels are because it is possible to drop a wheel over the edge. There are other hazards. Crossing a desert called the Dash Delilah, they were hit without warning by a sandstorm. You don't fight a sandstorm. You stop. You have to stop. Um, you can't see where you're going. And you have to batten everything down to protect passengers from driving sand, because the force of the wind can really rip things off the vehicle. Attempt to get some kind of landmarks before the visibility went completely. The sand does obliterate your tracks and you, know, you really can't tell where you are, where you've come from and, and, and where you're going to. Then you see some Afghan come dozing out of the sand, hardly give you a look, and carry on past. You, you long to ask, where are you going? Where have you come from? But he just disappears into the murk, going about his everyday business. The far places of the earth have one great need in common, water. It is always the most precious of commodities, whether it comes by bucket or by tap. A traveller dirtied by the trek comes to appreciate this as waterless mile succeeds waterless mile. Running water becomes a luxury. To primitive economies, water is also a necessity. It is a power source that demands neither fuel nor feed. The shaft and cam and trip hammers may look crude as they pound the grain, but they're not vassal to the price of oil. In northern Afghanistan are great cotton fields. The method of collecting the crop is primitive. The cotton gin that transformed the American South has either not reached here or has been ignored. The economy has found its own balance. And what point has wealth if it excludes the excuse for jokes and laughter? <laughs>
As if there weren't enough mountains. They make a mountain of the cotton. You who travel do so because it is fun, or because it's education, or in search of some private dream. The Coochies travel because they have always traveled. They are the epitome of all nomadic tribes. They cross frontiers, but offer no passport or letters of credit. Who needs a passport when he has a camel? And when the donkey is his credit. It is the ultimate in togetherness. One moves, all move. Everything moves. When they die, they are buried by the side of the trail, and the trail is endless. There was death here too at Bamiyan, where Genghis Khan's nephew fell in battle. To his memory, the great conqueror decreed that every living thing, animals, trees, the very grass, should be swept from the Bamiyan Valley. Once it was a stopping place on the old silk route from China to Damascus. Today it would be forgotten, but for the two Buddhas that guard it, silent, cold, immense. Fifty miles from Bamiyan, in the center of the Hindu Kush, the five lakes of Bandi Amir lie 10,000 feet above sea level. Around the creation of the lakes, a legend has been woven, a tale of a great Muslim hero named Hazrat Ali. The story is that he had a great row with an infidel king called Baba, who at the time was attempting with a thousand slaves to build a dam across this river, and he was failing. As a result of his contretemps with Ali, Ali lost his temper rather badly and gave a great kick to the mountain up there, and it fell down and dammed the river, and that dam was known as Bandi High Bat, or Dam of Awe. Ali then got his sword, his famous sword Zul Zulfikar out and smote another chunk of mountain out and that was the Bandi Zulfikar, the lake of Zulfikar. Um, a nomad woman nearby who'd seen these mighty feats presented him with a cheese which he then placed in the river and that became known as the lake of the cheese or the Bandi Pamir. Then right at the very end the villagers were somewhat alarmed because their stream had completely dried up and when Ali had heard of their fears he merely scraped his five fingers across the top of the Bandi high bat here, which is how you get the continuous flow of water all the way down into the stream. The noise of Lahore in Pakistan is almost hurtful after the silent mountains of Afghanistan. But its buildings also have a soothing elegance, echoes of the British Raj and the Mughal emperors. After two months of juddering journey across Asia, the traveller finds in Kashmir a longed-for calm. Thank you. 
tents that have been their home give way to houseboats on a lake. We're waited upon hand and foot, tea in bed in the mornings, afternoon tea. The food we get is excellent by the European or purely Kashmiri food. Is this saffron rice? It really is quite blissful to be able to sit at a table with white linen and to be waited upon. Went to a wood carving factory. Hello. Hello. Good ride right on the Sikara? Yeah. It's very good, yeah. Peaceful. People do a lot of shopping and all the traders come to the boats and trot out their goods and invariably sell because they're very, very good salesmen. This is groovy and groovy flowers, yeah? splendid, groovy magnificent, right. fantastic, very this good smell. Good chocolate. This is peanut candy. See how much? This are about the three rupees each. Uh, that be too much. Not too much. We got them cheaper from the other place. Big size. It's not small size. Big, Big banana. Do you want to go halves them? This is a long jacket for men. A fur for generation, which That's goes it. from mother to daughter. A possum, shalakot. Mm. This is antelope. This is mulan, a mulan coat. That's it. <coughs> this is wolf. <laughs> this is Persian kitten. Yeah, I was explaining you something about the designing part of it. We transfer that whole design first onto the graph paper like this, make the full drawings of it. And that's all on scale. Then after that, suppose these are the colors to be used in this particular carpet. Each color has got its own mark and number in it. And those very marks and numbers you'll find everywhere we hear that gives the color scheme for the carpet. Now that goes to the weaver on the loom. If there are three or four members working together, one of them will just call out the pattern, the call of the numbers, saying put so many knots of red color, come back, leave so many knots behind, put so many knots of blue color, white color, so on and so forth. Then that's how the designs are done. Now, after we get them down, you know, looms, you know, we had to wash them. And this is what they look like when they're all completed. Look at a couple like that one of them. With a beautiful colors, the design in that one of it. That's like this way. They, they, they change the colors to here. Look at it this way, I color, uh, color in it. And then this way, it's quite different. Has this got any silk in it? No, it doesn't have any silk in it. It's all in cashmere wool, <laughs> but since the cashmere wool is very famous in the world, you must be knowing it. Many think of Delhi only as the capital of British India in the days of the Raj. They forget that the city has 2,000 years of history reflected in its architecture. The mere fact of being on the road brings its own realities. The map of our trail viewed from the armchair at home brings distant places close. You remind yourself almost with surprise that there are another thousand miles from Delhi to Kathmandu. A hundred and twenty of those miles bring us to Agra. This is real tourist country. But even the most hardened traveller would not choose to ignore the Taj Mahal. The mind of the traveller becomes sated with sight, sound, smell.
Now the traveller is on a road followed by a million pilgrims of another kind, the road to Benares. Benares is one of the world's holiest places of pilgrimage. Indians make their way here from all over the subcontinent. On the banks of the Ganges, perfectly ordinary people, prompted only by their Hindu faith, perform not only their ritual ablutions, but all the disciplines of yoga and the other accompaniments to meditation. India is as crowded as one reads about. It is as hot as one reads about. But above all, it's a place of total and continuing pressure. Now, some people love all of these things about India. I personally can't take it for long periods of time, and it makes me long to get back up into the hills. Nepal has this fascination for virtually everybody that I know. I think it's the mountains. People are always attracted to mountains, and Himalayas are very spectacular. crossed our final frontier. Here in the foothills of the Himalayas, we can finally give way to what dreams we will. I think it's true to say that the majority of people who go on these trips leave the trip at the end, change to some degree in some aspect from the person who joined that trip. It's my hope that people who start the trip as tourists may end it as travelers. A traveller is someone who proceeds through a country under his own initiative with a certain internal drive to learn, to find out something more than the superficial. The people who come with me are not quite that, otherwise they wouldn't be travelling with me in the first place. But equally, they need not be the sort of person who takes everything that they are told or read in a guidebook at face value. A traveller will question everything. He will not take anything for granted. If there is a sense of mystery about this land, then traveller be content. Perhaps this is what your modern odyssey was really seeking. Well done, folks. There you go, Kathmandu. Journey's end. Journey's end. Ramchandra <laughs> 
Cause they think life, boy, I do, you, 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 you